Well, I'm Ruth and live at Old Hall Community, and this is my partner, Richard, who also lives there. So I'm going to do the first bit in terms of talking through some of the, our personal journey going and, and arriving at Old Hall, and just give you a bit of an overview. And I've also sort of gathered some ideas from others at Old Hall as well about what makes it work. It's been going 41 years now, so something must be working, I would think. Um, and some of the vulnerabilities and pitfalls as well. So I've kind of got other people's views in as well. So I'll talk through the first bit. We'll try and keep that to about 15, 20 minutes, because I'm guessing there's a lot that will come out from the questions as well. And that always helps me learn so much more about Old Hall as well, or helps me to realise that actually I don't know half of it yet as well. OK. So, um, Old Hall Community, there's kind of like, it's a bit like a photo, photo album as well. So there's lots and lots of pictures to, to look at. I won't talk through these, they come up again. So, as I say, you're going to talk about our personal journey to Old Hall. And then, just to give you a bit of an overview of the place, its purpose, the people there, it's about 48 people there. I always kind of, people ask me how many people live there, and sometimes it's like, I'm not quite sure, which is really embarrassing that you don't know how many people actually live in your house. But last count, there was 48. Um, and as I said, I asked around other people, there's probably about, about 10 people of the original members, um, right down to some people. When did Dano moved in in February? So there's quite a kind of rage in terms of age, 93 down to three, as well as length of time served or whatever is the, membership is probably the, the, the correct term there, inmates, someone called it earlier, which uh, <laughs> can connect to as well. So, and also to say some of the vulnerabilities, it's interesting, some of the talks that have um, mentioned the money and time um, around that already and it just makes me hugely grateful to the bunch of people that had the sort of foresight to set it up. I know Old Hall wasn't the only one around about that time but it just makes me appreciate it so so much more now with a lot of the red tape and barriers. So our personal journey, um, we were living in, in Bristol for, I was there for about 10-12 years, lived two doors away from Kirsten in a very conventional street in Eastern, um, terraced house and I think work got a bit crazy and um, just remember turning to Rich and saying, God, should we just run away to a hippie commune? Um, <laughs> didn't know anything about communities, but we just thought there must be something else. Why are we working so hard to pay the mortgage and we live in these separate boxes? Everyone's paying their own electricity bill, their own broadband. There must be a different way. So we sold a house. It took us a while to sell it. And during that time, we began to talk to other people and we discovered Diggers and Dreamers website. We'd never heard of that before, but we looked on it and um, just sort of began to think, is this something we'd want to do? Um, could we do it? How does it work? Um, there's a lot of dreamers, not many diggers, and how does the whole thing kind of fit together? I'm a quite a practical person myself. Um, so we found Old Chapel Farm, um, which is in Mid Wales. I don't know if anyone knows of it. Yeah. Beautiful spot. Um, and we visited and moved there. We were there for about two years. Okay. We weren't quite sure how long we'd be there or whether it's going to be a permanent um, part of our life, but it gave us long enough to know that we wanted more of this community living. It was quite small, um, and we wanted to move somewhere that was a bit bigger and a bit established, more established. Funnily enough, when we were looking in Bristol at Diggers and Dreamers, we saw Old Hall. It's difficult to say Old Chapel Farm and Old Hall and get the right one. I looked at Old Hall and I thought, no, it's too big can't do that. I can't eat my dinners with everyone. It's a bit weird. But it's interesting, after two years, it gave us a real chance to think through what was it that we personally wanted in the community and what would work for us, because I'm guessing it's different for everyone. Um, and it was that sense of something that's established and, and bigger and somewhere that we could really find our sense of place and purpose. So where we were in Wales, it was rented. And where we are now, we bought in. And that, that was a distinguishing factor for us as well. But interesting that term of, of money. We could only buy in because we did quite well in the housing market and bought a house and sold it and had the equity to do it. So it's quite ironic, I think, at the same time. So here we are. Um, just coming up to two years ago now, we actually moved into Old Hall. Uh, it's over in Suffolk, so it's kind of, I'm guessing, east that way, mm -hmm. about 300 miles. Um, and... We went through, um, there's a potential membership process, so um, for people that are interested, you, you kind of apply, say you're interested, you go to visit, it's kind of a six day job interview that you're not really sure what you do, um, they're checking you out, we're checking them out, um, and then at the end of the visit you um, reply and say whether you're still interested to proceed, what you liked about it, <coughs> what you think might be difficult and the challenges of living in the community, and you know, you're on the outside, you just know this bunch of people are meeting up talking about you and deciding whether they want you back or not. So um, it's like, it is like a job interview, but a really, really important one, because when they say yes, 
it's an amazing feeling because you know they really want you and as a community everybody has to say yes so if one person says not sure no it, it's closed there so it's kind of a big thing when you say you know yes to people coming in we're now on the other side of the fence deciding who wants to move in it's a really really important decision actually it's important that everybody agrees on it as well okay so we had three visits um, the first one was just checking it out, but I remember as they progressed and we really wanted to live there, they became more and more important. And it's like, what do you say? What do you do? You've got to be yourself. What's the finances of the house? Will it survive? What are the people there like? Lots and lots of considerations. There was times I just had to run into a room and just go to Rich, oh, you know, <laughs> what's going on? What's going on? What have you, what have you said to who? <laughs> So there's some kind of points here. Why, why Old Hall for us? Um, the fact that it had been going 40 years when we were applying, it was just coming up to its Ruby Doo 40th anniversary. So that signaled to, to us that something must be working. I don't know if I'll ever work out what it is. And you were saying earlier, kind of that sense of it's ever evolving. I think the day I work it out would be the time to leave, actually. I don't think I'll ever work out how it works. But something worked. And it worked in a sense that it was very practical. So yes, there's lots of people dynamics there and not everyone gets on all the time, but I got a real sense in the visiting early on that people got on enough to go on with the jobs because when the potatoes need to be planted, they need to be planted. When the cows need to be milked, they need to be milked. When the dinner needs to be cooked, it needs to be cooked. So I got a real sense that whatever the differences are, people get on enough to get the jobs done. And I think that really is one of the key successes of the place as well. Sometimes I feel a bit dirty for saying this, but what made a difference for us is to be able to buy in. And I think it's not about the money, but it's the amount of commitment that you need to do that. So we knew if we buy in, there may not be an easy way out either. Okay. We, could, we could leave and not live there, but a certain amount of our kind of money would be, would be tied in there as well. So, so something about that for us, it wasn't the, the, the paper money, but that signalled a, a huge sense of, of commitment, which then I think... Kind of, I think, to, to the last point there, that sense of show, shared ownership. There was something that was really important to me, that we shared the land and we shared this amazing big house and the ownership of it and the animals. You know, there's eight cows there. It's quite, you know, quite cool to think I'm share only the cows now and, and, and tractors. <laughs> and that, for me, was quite attractive as well. And it's quite, you know, it's quite cool to tell your friends as well. Um, <laughs> another big part of it, we like the people there. Uh, well, I wasn't quite sure what we'd expect, but they seemed a real mixture of people and, again, some quite pragmatic people. I thought, well, there's you know, this going to be a bunch of, of hippies here where nothing gets done, but it wasn't. It was really important that, for us, people, you know, they've lived there long enough to work some things out, um, but they're not blocking of new ideas either. So there was a balance of that as well, and I had a real respect for people that had been there since the start and just knew how to get on with people, how to make a household work of that number, but also the agricultural part was a strong attraction for us as well, to produce the food and the energy. We were very attracted to that. I think when looking back, one other reason for leaving Bristol was just that sense of a disconnection from other people, something's not quite right, and the disconnection from the land where our food comes from as well and the energy. So we were, we were seeking somewhere that we could be with other people to try and um, work less in the outside to earn money to have to buy food, but work harder on the land to produce our own food, which I think we get fairly close to doing. You have to keep me right on time, actually. Good. Good. Okay, so there's 48 people, I think, um, in 29 units. So there's a full unit, which is probably four bedrooms, right down to a sixth of a unit, and they vary in terms of size. So we five pound membership, and the size of the unit or the loan stock determines your living space, which has a, a front door that you can close. So there's private living spaces as well, um, as well as sh community spaces. So there's a shared dining room, um, sort of. TV rooms, meeting rooms, and there's also guest rooms. So if you've got a very small living space and you want friends and family to stay, they can stay in a guest room around the house. They're not, they're not all en suite, so they don't suit everybody. Um, building itself is an old manor house. So one of the books, um, it's not a commercial break, but if you are interested in history, it's quite an interesting history. It was originally a manor house, um, and then was a priory, and then... The nuns left when the Second World War started for fear of um, the soldiers' invasion, and then it was a, a friary, and then it was empty for a few years before a bunch of people bought it for... I could do a guessing game here. In 1974, what do you reckon that building and 70 acres of land would have gone for? <coughs> I bet someone probably knows it, actually. Someone probably knows. Hmm? How much money? How much money, yeah. What, did, what, did, what was it on the market for? 
74,000. 74, 74, so, you know, it, it made it very possible at that time, but again, still a huge commitment for the original members. Okay. Yeah. Very well. It's less than I sold my house in Bristol. <laughs> 70 acres of land, beautiful space in Constable country, so very close to where um, Constable painted the hayway. And the house. And the house, yep, yep. Um, so this is from the website. Again, some of you might know this. If you know of Old Hall, who are we? We're a group of families and individuals who have chosen to live together. As I said, there's a number of family members there from the start. So people come and go. I think, interestingly, more recently, the newer people have been the more recent people to leave. Okay, so there's an interesting recent transition. But there's enough people there that have been there long enough to give it some sort of gravity and some say, sense of sort of weight, really. And then we also see ourselves as a part of the wider community rather than separated from it. So children will go to the local school, people will work locally, or, or London's only an hour on the train as well. We're members of the local bike club, so you know, you're getting connected to the outside kind of world a little bit, which seems to be quite important. Although that said, I, I haven't socialised much with the local village because so busy on the, on the kind of land or the jobs, so that can be a bit of a, a distraction from, from linking up locally as well. Ethos, there's no single ethos, um, and it's really the beliefs and the values are div as, div as diverse as the individuals living there. So I guess that means it's ever-changing as well. But I think the third one is that there was a second one there is a sense of what holds people together, that that interest in the, in the environment, and that's different for everybody, and also just wanting to live more of an egalitarian, cooperative and healthy lifestyle. So that probably a bit of a cover-all option. Again, people sort of vary in different um, dimensions with those as well. So we farm the land and have animals there and try and live as organically as we can. And decision-making is by consensus, which is, I find a fascinating <coughs> process process and concept. I'll probably whiz through some of these. Meals are shared. Quite amazing. I think I put quite a bit of weight on when I first moved in, actually. <laughs> so there's various veg patches that get rotated. So there's brassicas, uh, root crops, uh, loads of sweet corn, loads of, loads of fruit. Um, there's potatoes. So we ha I don't think we ever buy potatoes in. Um, so they're grown there. Wheat's grown to make bread as well. There's a daily kind of rotor for bread making. Masses of orchards, apples, pears, plums. I think they used to make a lot of cider, but I think there's a few hazy summers and that's not <laughs> done so often now either. Jobs didn't get done that year. <laughs> so the aim really is to produce as much as we can eat. And then the next challenge is to preserve it or to freeze it to help us through the winter. And then any surplus of the veg is sold on the gate um, locally. Well, yeah, it's very local because it's a front gate. But I think the local village, you know, they really to enjoy that kind of, that's the connection with Old Hall a little bit. Um, and then that money goes back into the land account so to be back into buying other items. So how that works is you sign up for a different um, veg crop. And we didn't want to compete with the guy that's been doing the, uh, the potatoes for the last 40 years because we're quite new to it. We didn't want to get that wrong. But there's a gap um, for onions. So we, we take responsibility for onions, um, 6,000 of them and kind of, you kind of coordinate it. So this is planting them, so we let people know it's going to be one Saturday afternoon, rang the bell, and loads of people came out and, and helped us to actually get them in the ground, because it's, it's quite a big job. Got a herd of red poles and jerseys, which we milk, so we don't buy milk in. We're probably totally self-sufficient, I would say, and particularly wheat, potato, and, and dairy, so you, you could survive on that alone, I guess. Um, so hand milk him. Make cheese. Don't buy any cheese. Yeah, it's very yummy. Got some if anyone wants to taste it, actually. Um, butter as well. Chickens. Turkeys. Got those new last year. Um, and we've got ten, <coughs> ten poults as well, so ten little ones. It's quite exciting. Pigs. Sheep. So how it tends to work organisationally is there's rotor boards. Um, so they get sort of blanked out each Sunday and, and you just sign up to the jobs that you want to do. So there's no one particularly telling you what to do, you kind of very much find your place. So I'm part of the cow group and the chicken group and the pig group. Um, I guess I like animals. Um, so you can do as much or little of any job as you want. The expectation is that you do 15 hours a week. Some people do a bit less, there's a lot of people that do an awful lot more and I don't think it would work without a, a lot of people doing a kind of a significant amount. Pretty big wood store. So each unit has a wood burning stove. Some have radiators. So that needs, um, the wood needs sort of collecting and processing and stacking. 
Um, and we get a lot of the wood from um, locals that know of us. Um, and in the storms, October year before last, lots of trees came down, so they know they can call old hall and a tractor and sort of chainsaws to turn up and a bunch of people to, to remove it and, and it helps us to, to keep warm. We've got a dragon. So it's like a biomass heating system, I guess, and that heats a lot of the hot water, all of the hot water for the house is constant hot water and feeds some radiators as well. If that stops working, we've got gas that, that, that kicks in as well. Dragon food, pretty much anything. Again, people will let us know they're having their house done up and want uh, timber removing. So the panels were put in last year um, as part of the 40th celebration. They're about 45,000 and we reckon we'll make that money back in about 8 to 10 years, so significantly reducing our electricity bill. Got a borehole, um, and again, that's again reduced our water rates, but also really importantly in the east of England, very different from Wales, over there it doesn't rain very much. So when there's a hose pipe ban, that's quite an impact on our, our crop, so that it means that we can continue to water crops and it tastes much better than the stuff that comes out of the taps. Social events, so get together Christmases or Easter's, so there's a social secretary that makes sure the community, as well as meal times, have um, times that we come together. There's a sauna, it's an amazing thing to have in your garden. Recently the roof was, was redone. Outside groups will come and use some of the spaces, although it's not one of the main kind of factors of um, the community. I know there's other places like Moncton Wild or Lauriston that will run a lot of workshops and make a lot of income from it. This is really driven by the interests of the people um, there. So there's yoga sessions. But again, that's good because people from the local community come to run it and come to attend. So that's a good way to kind of mix again. Art groups. Um, someone here from... The volunteer, International Volunteer Service come regularly to kind of, there's a group that meets regularly there as well. Beekeeping monthly, I think, um, use the space as well. So the people, as I said earlier, um, I don't know if I mentioned Jo, you can probably guess who Jo is at 93, and then Lana in the front there, it was her th <coughs> third birthday last week, so there's quite a, quite a mix of ages there. Uh, we also have woofers, so volunteers, a guy there, who's over from Spain at the moment, they tend to be an internationals as well, come for two weeks at a time in exchange for their board and lodgings. Graphs. Um, so this is a spread of ages, so um, people from the 90s down to under 10. What's interesting is the bulk there, I would say, is in the 50s and 60s. So it is an ageing community. So some people see that as, as a problem, and it is in some ways. I think it would be a problem in, in 10 years' time. So the idea is that right now we're trying to attract younger members. When we were applying, we weren't sure if we were young enough to get in at, at mid-40s, but, but they, they took us, which is good. Um, but interestingly, I would say the bulk of the work is done by the 50s and 60-year-olds, people that aren't needing to go out to earn an income. Mm -hmm. So it's really interesting. We say we want younger members, but if that happens, my guess, if they've got families, they'll have to go out to work and they'll have less ability to help us to produce. The cost will go up to live there. So it's an interesting conundrum, which I don't think we've got our heads around yet. Decades of membership. Um, so again, there's, a, there's a, you know, a good chunk. Looking at that, the majority are there from, from, from the start and still there. Most still positive as well. <laughs> but it is quite, can be quite a hard place to leave. And some people have mentioned that, that you know, to leave there, even if you get your money back, it doesn't always convert into being able to buy somewhere on the outside. How are we doing time? Time. Yeah, yeah, quicker, yeah. Friends and family, interestingly, a lot of the children that grew up um, there have moved away. So some did come back to live, but they, they've left again. Actually, interesting to buy a house and to get on the property ladder. So what works? So I'll just go through this quickly. I asked others there. So what works in terms of the setup? Okay. So it needed a group of committed people with a vision and a suitable property, and then a real commitment to, and, the, and how they describe that commitment to put the money on the line actually to put the money on the line and to move in. And a lot of people said it was the original structures that were set up at that point in time that have really served us well now. So, for example, working out how, if someone wants to leave, how do they get the money back? So the legal and financial structures were really, really important, as well as the, the, the consensus decision-making and the regular meetings as well. Ongoing, people say it's the size of the group, um, and I noticed that from being where we are now to where we are in Wales. Any issues are diluted, it's less of an impact that people leave. And someone said there's just enough of a supportive, accepting, forgiving group there. So even if people kind of get a little bit frustrated or a bit narky around the edges, there's enough people to kind of try and help people to see it a different way to keep the thing moving. 
I think the tasks are important um, part of the, the place as well. That's what drives and brings people together. And interesting, somebody said at the bottom there is enough, inherit enough people with inherited wealth that can spend the time there to do the jobs. And I think that is the reality of, of the place right now. That might change. Moving in, what's it like? Many layers, many levels. That was my comment. I think I've got it, but then something else happens and there's a whole kind of another dimension to it. People say it's daunting and amazing when you move in. Every, this was from an, Lauren, who's 11. She said, everyone's so different that I just have to adapt to get on with everyone. I thought that was quite sharp for, for an 11-year-old. Um, and I share the bottom one there. It's great to hear how the older members have, have done stuff in terms of getting on with people, as well as fixing tractors and just keeping things going. So it's great to listen to people there, it's been a while. Pitfalls, common phrase, that's not how we do things around here. Some people catch themselves in the moment and go, right, well, we will change. But sometimes it, you know, it does feel like it's a big entity and you can change it a bit, but to change it too much would take quite a lot more thinking through. And it's part, I, 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 I'm okay with that because it works. <laughs> um, time and money, limited resources, communication. Someone moved the cows and then someone else went to milk and they didn't know where they were. So there's little things like that, which I guess are no different to a lot of households, actually. The big, I think, um, potential pitfall or the biggest struggle people have there is what happens when you don't think someone else is doing enough and then you don't speak about it and it just builds up and builds up and builds up. And it's difficult because some jobs, that jobs are very visible. If you're driving a tractor, you get seen. But if you're doing the counts, you don't get seen. So it's really, it's one to get your head around, actually. Um, fire and illness, that we had a small fire last year and actually if that took hold, the whole building would probably go. The, the cost, someone talked about cost of building regulations, it, we, we, couldn't, we couldn't fire safe that building to be able to... For example, at the moment we're aware that it's excluding some people, so we want to be able to rent, to, to draw other people in. We, we can't legally do that because it would, to make it safe for fire regulations, it would, just, it would be too expensive actually. Well, decision making, regular Friday meetings, there's a chair and that's a role in, um, kind of role of office if you like. If meetings or discussions take too long, that's taken to a breakout meeting that comes back into the next Friday meeting. Not everyone goes to meetings. Some people go where they've got certain interests, but there's a core group that go. Um, how decisions get made, someone said slowly. <laughs> but there is a bit of lobbying for support. If I had something I wanted to take to a meeting, I'd just check things out just to see where kind of people's views were. Not in a divert, you know, devious way, but just to, just to learn and go, how do, how do things happen? How can we create change? <coughs> younger perspective, I sat down with some of the younger members and I was really surprised. Someone said they really like the farm and then grow in their own food. And they said it grows really quickly. And I thought we were a society that was trying to move away from fast food. So I thought that was quite an interesting concept. Massive garden to play in. Someone said they like the people there. And they said when their mum and dad are trying to do stuff in the unit and they can't do it, other people come and help. Kind of the flip side, one of them said, it's a bit weird telling your friends at school you live in a house with 40 other people. <laughs> and sometimes they bring their friends home. Some of them love it. Some of them go, this is a bit weird. Um, so that's a difficulty for some of the younger me members growing up there. And somebody said when they leave stuff lying around, someone else moves it. And again, I can remember that when I was growing up as well. So how would you sum up Old Hall? I think we're coming towards the end. Um, there we go. Posh hippie lifestyle. Uh, special place. The last two there to finish on. Special place. That was from Joe, who's 93. And the bottom one there is from Lana at three. She says, the best thing about Old Hall is the mud, the wiggly worms and the carrots. <laughs> I think they're saying the same thing. Special place, mud, worm, wiggly worms and carrots. Questions? I don't know how long we've got. Sorry, it probably went longer than I thought. Thank you very much, Ruth.